right. Um, so yesterday we were talking about Parshas Tazria, and uh, uh, the, the first the first thing is that I'm back on page six hundred eight. There are a few points over here. Uh, on page six hundred eight, where it says that a woman. Uh, after she gives birth, if you look on 608, and she becomes purified, she's, she becomes tummy for a certain amount of time, and then she brings a, uh, a, a korban. And if you notice, on Pasuk Zvav, and if, when she fulfills, it's about six lines down, when when she becomes purified for a son, after having a son or a dog at her, Tavi keves ben shnaso la'ola, she brings a sheep as an offering, uben yona otor lechata, she brings a dove, or a tor, is also a turtle dove of some sort, as a sin offering, Now the question is, why does this woman have to bring a korba? So one korba she brings is a korba to thank HaKadosh Baruch for getting her out of danger. And when a woman gives birth, when a woman gives birth, she actually brings, nowadays, there are no korbanos, but a woman does bench gomel. The bench gomel is anybody who's been in a dangerous experience, anybody who's had a life-threatening experience, has to bench gomel. Uh, so a woman who's given birth, even though statistically, uh, for example, at Mayane, Mayane Yoshua Hospital in B'nai Brak, where they've had literally thousands and thousands of births, Bor Hashem, no woman has ever died in Mayana and Ashova birth, but there is, an, there is a certain element of danger in childbirth. A woman for the first three days after she gives birth is called, is called a chola. She's a, she's, she's a, she's a, she's has to eat on Yom Kippur. Within three days, she has to eat on Yom Kippur, and between three days and seven days, if she feels weak, she also should eat on Yom Kippur. She's only out of Sakana. Uh, she, for the first uh, month, she's considered, and there's a Yiddish word called a kimpaturin, I'm not sure what that means, by the way. It just means that she's a woman who's given birth and she's weak and weepy. Uh, and just that my mother always used that word when my wife would give birth. She said, "You have to remember, she's a kimpaturin." You know, oh, all right, if you say so. You know, you know, just uh, you know, you know. But and so it means that she's that she's weak and, and, and she, so so after she gives birth, nowadays uh, the woman either either one or two things happens. Either the woman benches goma. What we'll do is you get ten men come over to the house or go over to the mechitza. And she stands behind them and she actually makes a bracha. Or sometimes the husband will make the bracha for her, be her shlech, to make the bracha for her. But she, it is a, so we understand she brings an offering. By the way, a, a life-threatening situation means that a person, it, it, you see, uh, somebody once asked, a guy was driving, and he, uh, guy was driving, and he swerved at the last minute and avoided an accident. So we want to know if he's supposed to make, if he's supposed to bench Gomel. The, the answer is no, because then people would be benching Gomel every day. You know, if you swerved in Israel to avoid, you know, you, you'd be benching Gomel. You'd be benching Gomel more than you bench after eating. So, uh, so you don't bench Gomel for a near miss. You bench Gomel if a person was in an accident and did not get hurt or did not get killed in the accident, uh, where, where he was in a serious accident, not a fender bender. So it's only when it's actually happened, not when it was, I remember a guy was once on a bus. This guy was a, an older man. So he goes in shul, he goes up and he benches Gomel. And he makes a bracha. So somebody asked him afterwards, why did you bench Gomel? And I was standing right there. He goes, well, I was on a bus and they said there was a suspicious object. You know, that's close enough for me. So somebody said, w w was it a bomb? He goes, no, it turned out somebody just forgot their suitcase. So the guy just made a bracha levatola in public, right? That means he was never in any danger. He was never in any danger. There was a situation, he said, that's close enough for me. Well, that's not close enough for me. They're not close enough for me. Allah is, you wouldn't have made, you shouldn't have benched Gomel under those circumstances. But a woman has to bring a korban because she got out of life-threatening situation, number one. But why does she bring a sin offering? What'd she do wrong? She gave birth. It happens every day. What'd you, what'd you do? You know, because she had a girl? Uh, yeah, you, she brings a sin offering if she had a boy also. You know, so, well, what'd you do wrong over here? That she has to bring a, that she has to bring a sin offering. So the Gemara says that what she did wrong is that when a woman goes into labor, the women say it hurts. I told my wife once, I think, it's a, I think that, whole, that whole pregnancy childbirth thing is all attention getting thing. I said it once. The, uh, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> I got such a lump on my head after that. Yeah, I benched Gomel. So the, uh, the uh, what do you call it? It hurts. It hurts. And it could be, you know, it, it, and it could be, you know, it could, there could be problems. So when a woman is in pain, and it could be very intense pain, the closer they get to say, nowadays they give women epidurals. They have, they have an epidural, which is, a, which is a shot in the spine, which is also no walk on the beach. 
but uh, 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 it, it, the, the pain gets so intense. The Gemara says that a woman will actually make an oath, and if not verbally, at least in her mind, she will make a vow that she will not be with her husband anymore because she does not want to get into the situation again. She will not allow herself to get pregnant again because she doesn't want to have to go through this. Interestingly, after seven days after having a son, and 14 days after having a, a daughter, she becomes purified and she's allowed to reunite with her husband. Now, the uh, the the the, the commentary says, why is it that the the why is it that that the uh, that the uh, 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 purity takes place sooner with a son than with a daughter? Seven days for a son. What you say when it says 33 and 66, that's a different form of tumah. As far as reuniting with her husband, it's already permissible after seven days or after 14 days after the birth. By Torah law, uh, rabbinic law then, 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 then puts any restrictions as long as a, a woman is seeing any, any sort of bleeding at all. She's tummy nowadays. But this is by pure deoraisa law. And the reason is because a woman overcomes the regret sooner with a son than a daughter. Why is that? And again, the Torah is only telling us reality. The Torah is not saying anything disparaging. Because when a boy is born, this is not limited to Jews. This is a... Uh, 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 this, is, this is universal. There is a greater joy when a boy is born than when a girl is born. That's a fact. And when a man has a wife, even though she may regret having gotten in that situation, once she has a boy, and you see she sees the tumult, and particularly the commentary said when she sees how, hus how happy her husband is with the boy, she will overcome her regret sooner with a boy than a girl. Now, I've seen this. I have seen this blatantly with women. With women, I've seen this, where you know, my, my wife is in, a, you know, in the doctor's waiting room with a newborn. And if he's wearing blue, you know, there's an older lady waiting, and she goes, oh, wow, what's his name? And kuchkiku, kuchkiku, and she's all over him, I mean, because he's wearing blue, because it's a boy. And if it's a girl, it's being a, oh, mazel tov. Then she goes right back to her reading, or her knitting. That's a, you know, that's one of mine. I don't need, you know, that, it's, it's unbelievable. I was in the house, my wife was once in the hospital, when uh, she had gone into an early contraction, so she had to be hospitalized toward the end of a pregnancy. And she was in the hospital in the, in the, in the maternity ward. It's the, only happy, it's the only happy section of the hospital. And so she was there for about three weeks. So I go to the hospital to visit her. Now the nurses were, on, were shifting, and as the nurses would go off on shift, they would talk about which lady has given birth. And I saw this over and over by the, by the nurses in the hospital. She would say to them, what happened to, uh, what happened to Mrs. Cohn? Yeah, she had a daughter. She goes, oh, Mazel Tov. Yeah, she walks down the hall. What happened to Mrs. Goldstein? She had a boy. Mazel Tov, right? What time? Were they? It's a completely different reaction. Completely different reaction. So it turns out whether it should be or not, you know, is, is, is immaterial. That's a fact. Therefore, she overcomes it. So number one, there's the atonement for having made that vow whether verbally, whether she verbalized it or thought it, she needs an atonement, number one. Number two, the commentaries say that there's got to be an atonement for uh, the sin of Chava, the original sin. It's, an, it's a, every woman who has pain of childbirth, that pain of childbirth is a result of Adam Harishon's original sin, where the wife was, where Chava was given the curse that Be'etzev told the Bonim, that you're going to go through the pain of childbirth. That means that before the original sin, a husband and wife would live together and baby just, just is born painlessly. And it's only after the original Avera of eating from the Eitz Adas that there was a decree that there's going to be the pain and the discomfort of childbirth. So I do know a woman who was actually paralyzed from the waist down uh, because she had an epidural uh, and the epidural was given in something went wrong. And by the time they got to the doctor, it's too late. She was in bed for the last uh, over 20 years. A woman in my neighborhood, for over the last 20 years, she's been paralyzed from the waist down from, from an epidural. There are also cases of women who, you know, enter say, a state of danger during pregnancy. Uh, they get something called taxibia, which is some sort of, uh, some sort of poisoning. And, and, and uh, what do you call it? They're, 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 you know, it's not, it's, not a, it's not a game. And therefore, they have to bench goa. But they, 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 at a deeper level, there's also an atonement for the sin of Chava because of the pain and the difficulty that it involves. Now, if you take a look at the next section, it starts like this. When a person has, as we started yesterday, when a person has one of these signs of Tsaras, and it gets all the various, the Torah goes through the various, uh, what do you call it? So the first thing that we have to pay attention to is why is it called Adam? When a man has a seisor sapachas, 
could have just as you said what? Ish. Ish. Why is it Adam? What's the difference between Adam and Ish? So I once pointed out to you that the word Adam, if you reverse the letters of Adam, Adam turns into the word Me'od. Mem Aleph Dalad. Me'od. What does Me'od mean in Hebrew? Very. Very. Very much. Very much. And Rav Hutner Zatzal said that the Torah, the word Adam in Lashon HaKodesh obviously contains the the, the actual essence of the word, the word me'od tells you that every Adam has very much potential. How much potential does a person have? Very much. That means there's limitless potential. We're never at a point where we're finished with our growth. You could always grow more. There's always more that you can do. There's always more to grow. So Adam, it starts out with the, with the, with the expression of very much potential. Now the Al Sheikh HaKodosh points out that if you'll notice it says V'hoya be'or besoro l'neget saras on the top line on page 610, in there shall be. And we know that the Gemara says the word V'hoya is an expression of simcha. You know, why would one be celebrating the fact that he has saras, right? It's a person he has one of these signs of saras in his flesh and it shall be as a, 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 an affliction of tzaras. Why would that be happy? Why, why would that be happy? And what's that got to do with Adam? What's that got to do with Adam? What's one thing got to do with the other? So the, uh, uh, um, the Alshech explains, the other commentaries, I've had guys have asked me, They've been on college campuses, or they've been in other areas where, where people uh, seem to suffer from clothing allergies. And uh, um, they, they, you know, there are girls all over the place, that not non-males left, right, and center. And after a while, it doesn't even bother you anymore. I don't notice it. it. doesn't, you know, you just kind of go through your day. And then you come to Yeshiva, and you're uh, focusing on Shmira uh, Seinayim, and guarding your eyes, and not looking at the wrong things, and you're focusing on Torah, and they say, then you go out in the street, and, and for, you know, once a day you walk out, you go over to the train, and boom, you see something, you see a non-male type person, and, and you just, the Yetzirah is jumping all over you. And you're like, my goodness, I thought I was past this. Then you take a look, and it's a woman who's 94. But you're, you're, you're like, my goodness, what happened over here? How, how did, it, I thought I was, and of all after, now I'm getting, boom, I was there, I was in the University of Arizona, in summer, and, and nothing, maybe nothing bothered me, you know, if it's not over here. And the answer is that it did bother you. But if a person is coated, if you're wearing a jacket, or you're wearing a suit that's coated with mud, and somebody throws another clump of mud on you, you don't notice it, because it's all muddied anyway. So you don't even that you're desensitized to it. doesn't mean they haven't noticed it. doesn't mean that it's not having an effect that you're just desensitized to it because you've been so immersed in it. When a person is wearing a white shirt, and somebody sprinkles even the slightest piece of dirt on him, then all of a sudden it shows up, hey, there's a piece of dirt over here. Adam means that when we are in a state of Adam, when we are at the highest elevated state, that's when these laws applied. It's only when we were at these applies. V'hoya be'or besaro, the simcha, the joy of having saraseh, that's an indication that we're at a very high level. We're on such a high level that even something as slight as Lashon Hara or a little bit of haughtiness, then all of a sudden there's going to be, there's a, there's a, what do you call it? There's a, there's a response. There's something that we notice. When a person is now, after the base of Migdash is destroyed, at the level we're at now, nobody knows that we don't see anything. It doesn't even affect us. we got so many problems, so many issues. We're at such a low level that it doesn't affect us. This is talking about somebody who's at a very high level. And therefore, the al says, that's why there's a simcha. The simcha indicates that if there's saras, that means we're doing very well. Just that a person lost a little control of his mouth. And by the way, the commentaries say, why does Tazria follow the previous Parsha? What did the previous Parsha speak about? The end of, of Shmini, what was it talking about? The animals, various animals that choose its cod, split hooves, fish, fins, scales, all the... So the commentaries point out, one commentary, Meforshim says, that the last Parsha was talking about being careful about what goes into your mouth. And this Parsha starts talking about being careful what comes out of your mouth. Right, which objectively is much harder. Right, objectively it's much harder. But that's the juxtaposition of Parshas Tazriya to Parshas to Parshas Shmini. 
that we're now talking about the signs, number one. There are others that say that we, we're talking about the signs of the kosher species. Human beings have signs as well. One of the signs of a, of a kosher Jew is bris milah. The other sign of a kosher Jew is that the parents kept the laws of family purity, and he has that sign. And somebody whose parents didn't, so he will. But these are the signs of the kosher human being as opposed to the signs of the kosher animal. So here, uh, uh, by the way, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, and I think this is extremely important for everybody to hear, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein was asked, yesterday somebody was asking me about a coin who married a divorcee. If a coin marries a divorcee, which is a prohibitive, or a coin marries a convert, a coin is not allowed to marry a woman who's converted. What if he does? The child in a prohibited relationship of a kohen is called a cholol. And a cholol means, it comes from the word chulin, where he has desecrated the kedusha. Now the law of a cholol is that if a kohen marries, let's say, a divorcee, the marriage is a valid marriage. Meaning if somebody else w lives with this woman, he's committing absolute adultery. As opposed to, let's say, a man marries his sister. Let's say a man marries his sister, hariat mekudeshesli. Right? They're from Tennessee. And a man marries his sister, and he, and, and he says, rat Mikude. They say, you know you're a redneck if you've married three times and you have the same set of in-laws, right? So the, uh, the what do you call it? What's that guy's name? Jeff, what was the guy's name? The guy who made all the redneck jokes. Uh, Jeff, Jeff, Jeff Foxworthy, I think. Yeah. So, so what do you call it? The, the, a guy, if a guy marries his sister, have a chopa, kedusha, and harat mekudeshesli. They're not married. They're not married. A guy lives with his sister. He's not committing adultery. Maybe committing immorality, but it's not a death penalty. It's not adultery. A coin marries a divorcee, or a coin marries a gior. It's 100% kedusha. They're just not allowed to do it. But it is a marriage. The marriage counts. And the marriage counts such that she's a married woman, and the only way she can marry somebody else is if she gets a get from the coin. A sister who marries a brother, she doesn't need a get. She, a get. she may need a doctor. She doesn't need a get. So the guy who marries, the coin who marries this woman, a child is called a cholol, which means he is essentially a non coin Okay, that's one level, but he's not a mamzer. He's not a mamzer. He can marry any Jewish woman, just that their children will also be chololim. Okay, which puts certain limitations, but it's not the end of the world. I had a guy once here in Or Sameach, I was walking years ago. I'm walking into Shear. I'm, 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 you know, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. I haven't even gotten through my second cup of coffee yet. And the guy walks over to me and goes, uh, are you Rabbi Kaplan? I said, uh, yeah, yeah, last time I checked my identity card, yeah. He says, somebody told me you're a Kohen. I said, there, there are rumors to that effect, yes. He says, well, you know, my father's a Kohen and my mother's a divorcee. Does that make me something? You know, whatever happened to, you know, I forgot y'all of the Yavo questions. You know, you know this is, <laughs> does, does that make me something? So I said, well, well you know, you know, listen, you know, it, he, I'm in the hallway. He goes, I said, listen, if it's as you say, I mean, first of all, you have to speak to halachic authority. But if it's as you say that your father was a Kohen, I mean, it has to be checked out and everything, a lot to check over. But if it's as you say, theoretically, if your father was a Kohen and your mother's a divorcee, then, yeah, there's something called a chol that would make you a chol, if it's all true. The guy says, oh, that's what I thought. Somebody else told me that too. Thanks. And off he walked. Another cholol strode off into the sunset. You know? <laughs> you know? And that was at 10 o'clock in the morning. So, so the, the, uh, the, uh, by the way, the first question I was asked at Ursula when I started working here, first question I was asked, I come in, a guy says to me, I don't like my Hebrew name. Is it okay if I go by my English name? He didn't like his Hebrew name. If you knew his Hebrew name, you wouldn't have liked it either. So I said to the guy, look, my wife uses her English name. My wife goes by her by her." Uh, by her English name, Samantha. Yeah, that's not really, just kidding, it's Tammy. But uh, yeah, I said that my wife goes by her English name. And then I asked her about Aaron Feldman, who was Rosh Yeshiva today of Baltimore Yeshiva about the question. I know nobody asked her, you know, I, and I never thought about it. The guy asked her, and Aaron Feldman said it's fine. You know, he, he they told me that Rev. Aaron Cutler, he told Rev. Aaron Feldman told me Rev. Aaron Cutler had a Talmud whose Hebrew name was Ephraim, and he used to call him Freddy, right? That was his English name was Fred, so he called him Freddy. And he, they told me, so if Aaron Cutler could do it, as I said, that was the first question I was asked. Nobody trains you for this in rabbi, in rabbi classes, by the way. The second question I was asked was the guy who told me he's a Baal Tshuva, he hasn't been in contact with his father for three years because he hates him, and he wants to know after his father dies if he could not say Kaddish. <laughs> that nobody ever prompted me with that question either. How do you like that? That's a good one, isn't it? <laughs> That's a good one. 
So, you know, I was like, and, and I'm just like, oh, oh mm, that's interesting. Oh, the old not say Kaddish question, huh? <laughs> so I, I, actually, I actually sent him to a halachic authority who told him that uh, uh, if he really, really hates his father to that extent, then after his father dies, no, he does not have to say Kaddish, which is interesting. If he really dis despises his father, he, does, he said, but you are not allowed to do anything to expedite the death process. Right? <laughs> the, end, the end of the story, the end of the story was that somehow they did reconcile for a short time and he went to visit his father and then they had a blow up. So he took a hatchet and he turned his father's Lexus into a convertible uh, uh, which involved the police and, and everything else. So that was the end. Of, that was the end of that. So they said Kaddish for the for the Lexus, but the uh, that was the that was that was the end. So I tell you the questions you know that people could ask you. You know the the, the question in any event, in any event, Adam over here. Adam means that there's a tremendous potential. Now, there's a ish would have been a possibility. And I want to tell you an interesting incident that took place. Did you ever hear of Mendel Bayliss? Okay, there's a famous blood libel in Russia, Poland, Russia, one of those places, that uh, there's a, man, a Jewish man named Mendel Bayliss, and there was a blood libel, a Christian kid was filled, found killed, and they accused this Jew named Mendel Bayliss. If you've ever seen, I've seen a picture of Mendel Bayliss. Mendel Bayliss was, uh, it was, it looked like he stepped right out of the cover of Jewish Accountants magazine. You know, Mendel Bayliss was a little guy with round glasses who did not look like anything like a killer. And Mendel Bayless was put on trial for this blood libel. The blood libels have been going on for thousands of years where the accusation is that Jews have killed a Christian child to use their blood for the Pesach matzahs. Now, the absurdity of the accusation is such, the number one Jews are, have such an aversion to blood. They had a woman, and in the trial, uh, they called the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the servant who was working in the Bayless home, a non-Jewish servant was called in as a character witness, and she said, I've been in the kitchen with Mrs. Bayless where she cracks an egg, and if there's the slightest sighting of blood, a blood spot on the egg, she throws the egg away because Jews have such an aversion to blood. That was the character witness in the trial. So, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, there was a Jewish attorney and uh, in this trial, uh, there was a Jewish attorney, and uh, the prosecutor was a virulent anti-Semite, and somehow he knew a little bit about about uh, uh, scriptures. Now, uh, uh, Reb, you've heard of Rabbi Meir Shapiro of Lublin, Rabbi Meir Shapiro, who did Dafyomi, Rabbi Meir Shapiro. So when the trial started, by the way, the absurdity of the accusation of blood Jews Jews using blood in matzahs. First of all, we have an aversion to blood. Second of all, of all things. Of all things that we don't put any extra ingredients in, I told you matzah, the box of matzah says ingredients, water, flour. Of all, say if they would have said, yeah, Jews kill Christian children, use the blood in cholent. All right, you know, cholent, you know, sometimes got that little orange, orange look to it, you know, and goodness knows what else is, if you're ever missing your wallet at home, just ask your wife, yeah, I put it in the cholent. You know, you know who knows what they put in there. Of all things, of all the absurdities, and Rabbi Chonan Wasserman says, you know why this blatant lie that such an absurdity has persisted for so many years? So Rabbi Chonan Wasserman says, it was Mida Keneged Mida, because the brothers deceived Yaakov Avinu with blood. And when they deceived Yaakov Avinu with blood by dipping Yosef's Ksonis Pasim in blood, and they deceived Yaakov Avinu with the blood, there was an energy, a decree that was unleashed that the Jewish people are always going to be suffering from false accusations of using blood. That was, that's what Rebbe Chanav Wasserman says. I think the most recent blood libel, there was literally a blood libel, with it, with it, was, it was in Russia in the 19, 1950s, I think there was a blood libel. In any event, Rav Meir Shapiro of Lublin wrote a letter to this attorney. And then at some point in the, in the trial, and just shows you Rav Meir Shapiro of Lublin how sharp he was anticipating what's going to happen. This accuser said to uh, the, the prosecutor here, says, you know, the Torah says the word Adam. And the Gemara in the Yavama says, Atem kruim Adam, you the Jewish people are called Adam. The non-Jews are not called Adam. So to you, we're not human, we're not Adam, and therefore the blood is Hefker. And therefore that proves that you don't care about killing non-Jews, and obviously he did it. 
So the guy read Ramir Shapiro's letter. And he said to the guy, the defense attorney said to the guy, it's prohibited in the Torah, there are various sources in the Torah that prohibit us from killing, we're not allowed to kill non-Jews either, that's nonsense, and he quoted in the sources. And then he said that there's a reason we're called Adam. You're called Ish. And he shows them sources where the non-Jews are called Ish. Do you know what the difference is between Adam and Ish? What's the plural, plural for Ish? Ishim. There's a plural for Ish. Ishim. Anoshim. What's the plural for Adama, for Adam? There is no plural for Adam. He says, we're called Adam because the Jewish people are one united body. The proof is that here's one Jew who's on trial, and you got Jews all over the world who are upset about this Jew being on trial. We're all united. We're one. If there was one Christian on trial, would you, somewhere else in the world, would you care a lick about this guy being on trial? He says, you're Ishim. You're separated. And with that argument, he won the case. And there were Mayor Shapiro of Lublin, the, 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 the godless Mayor Shapiro of Lublin, wrote this letter before the guy even made the accusation. He knew this, this was coming. He knew the accusation was coming. He wrote him the letter. That, that was the argument that caused. So when it says the word Adam, Adam refers to Kla Yisrael at their highest state. And we're called Adam because we are united. Rahman al you have a tragedy in B'nai Brak. The whole country's in mourning now. The whole country is in New York, you can have a shooting in New York. You think anybody in Arizona, anybody in Denver cares about what happened in New York? Think anybody in Denver cares about what happened on the other side of Denver? Right? Who cares? Somebody got killed. Okay, so a Jew in Argentina, there's a, there's a Jew in Argentina gets killed, and the Jews all over the world like, are, are upset about anti-Semitism because we're all one united body. We're a united body. Whereas the, the, the nations of the world, and that's why there are always this accusation that Jews only care about Jews. The Jews only stick together and care about Jews. Why do Jews only give money to Jews? Our counter argument is, listen, if the Jews take care of the Jews and the Christians take care of the Christians, the Muslims take care of everybody, everybody will be taken care of. No, no, the Jews have to take care of everybody. The Jews have to take care of everybody. And not only that, the war in Ukraine is our fault. Right? Somehow the Jews, the war in Ukraine is the Jews' fault. Right? So that's why we're called, that's what we're called out of. Now, why does he go to the coin? I saw a remarkable, saw a remarkable, what do you call it? He goes to the coin, and the coin looks at this lesion. He looks at this discoloration, and he poskins whether he's tummy or tahor or if he has to be closed off. So first of all, one of the kind of the al says, you know why a coin looks at it? Because the coin is the ultimate in Kedusha. So the guy comes to him with something that made tummy, tummy, the coin looks at it. And when he's looking at it with the Kedusha, he can actually zap it and stop it from becoming worse. Don't ask me how to do that. I don't want to demonstrate. You know, if you pay me, I'll show you. But that's, a, that's what the al says, that the coin can actually, looking at it, it has an effect. But more importantly, the Torah goes on to describe, this is essential, I wanted to, I've mentioned this before, but I want you to know this. The Torah says that a guy who has sometimes, there's sometimes a coin will take a, one look and he'll say, Tame, right off the bat. It's Tame, you've got to close the guy off. Your Tame, go out of the camp. There, the Torah goes on to describe other times where the coin takes a look at it and says, I have to close you off, we'll re-examine it in seven days. And then in seven days they see, did it spread? What happened to it in seven days? Did it stay the same? Did it spread? So on and so forth. Why does it have to be closed off for seven days? The answer is that if he looks at it from one day to the next, he might not see any you know, the, the, the change. It may be so subtle that you can't notice the change. It's only when you look at it seven days later that you can tell, was there a significant change or not? This is why I say to you, sometimes people want to examine, have I grown? Am I growing? Am I improving? Am I Gomorrah? Am I improving in my Torah? Am I improving in my commitment? Don't check it. Don't take your temperature every day. Because if you take it ever on a day-to-day -day basis, you can't tell. You just can't see what happens. Take a look. Let a, let a period of time. Go three weeks. Go a month. And then look where you were a month ago. Look where you are now. Look where you are six months ago. Look where you are now. And that's the lesson. You want to see, did you, did you improve? Did you change? It's too subtle. It's too gradual. You can't see it from day to day. It's a mistake that people make. Look at yourself where you were six months ago. Look at yourself where you were a year ago. Look at yourself where you were even a month ago. And look where you are now. Then it becomes more blatant how much a person has improved, how much a person has changed. All right. See you tomorrow.